Thank you, everybody, and, and lovely to see everybody here. And um, I think um, I came because Sam told me to come, and I never say no when t Sam tells me to do something. <laughs> so that's, that's really why I'm, I'm here, um, but also because he's been a great supporter and so has Shared Health Foundation for all the work we've done. So a big thank you um, for that to Shared Health Foundation. I'm really here to talk to you about asthma, the lungs, and poverty. And you will know all about that. So nothing I say to you today will really be rocket science. It won't be anything that you haven't thought of. So I, I apologize for that in advance. But I don't apologize for trying to make us sit up and really think about the child in front of us and what is going on in their lives and what is going on outside their lungs that then affect their lives. So we spend a lot of time thinking about what medicine we should give to a child, what inhaler we should give, and we up and up and up their medication and we wonder why things aren't working. And the problem is things are often not working because of the dynamics within the household, because of the environment within there we're in, because of the understanding of the disease, and sometimes because of the stigma that may be related to it. And until we unravel that within a family, um, we really can't get to the bottom of what's going on. And so the last number of years has, in our work has gone really from a project we did many years ago looking at asthma in South Asian families and the stigma that was attached to it and the extended family within which families lived in to more recently work around homelessness and poverty and then thinking about how do those two interlink. So I'm going to try and talk a little bit about that with you. So the take-home message from all of this will be if the, if the medication isn't working that you're giving to a child, just stop for a bit and try and unravel what's going on maybe go and understand the dynamics between the family, who's actually the decision maker, who's actually the person who you need to influence. Because we're so used to, in the UK, which is why I love going to India and, and, and other countries in low-middle-income countries, is where families live within an extended environment and multi-generational families, there's a lot of dynamics going on. And the whole family comes into your clinic and you talk to everybody. Whereas we're in, we work in a very siloed way in the UK, which is okay, you're mum, you're empowered, you should be doing X, Y, Z, and we forget everything else that's going home on at home at the same time. And sometimes we also forget the, the challenges the families are facing. So it's easy, again, to say as doctors, why is that mum DNAing, or why is that mum not taking her medication to her child? But actually, when you're trying to feed your child and you're trying to just fill in all those millions of forms to pay for your electricity, you know, where does it come down on the list? And it's not saying it's right for the child, but it's, it's also a challenge for the family. So COVID, as we know, has actually caused even more problems. And that's why my talk's really about poverty, COVID, and the dangerous duo, because it was bad enough for children with asthma before COVID. It's become even worse now for many reasons, as we'll talk about today. I think. Oops, what have I done? Um, so what we're going to talk about, what impacts on child lung development, direct and indirect impacts of poverty in a post-COVID era, because it's, that's where we are, really. Well, we might not be post, but we're getting there somehow, we hope. And um, what approach we could take for the future. And just some take-home messages from some personal experiences. So poverty and the pandemic. Well, I mean, you've already heard today a lot about poverty, and I don't want to give you a lot of data about inequalities because you've already had that. But just to remind ourselves that the pandemic has thrown many, many people into poverty who were not in poverty before, who were on the edge of poverty. So 4.3 million children living in poverty in the UK in 2019 to 2020. The pandemic has pushed 700,000, probably more than that, people into poverty, and it's going to go up, as we know and 201,000 more unemployed than the pre-pandemic. So if you're in that situation, a lot of what we're going to talk about, like I said, is not top of your list, even though you probably, we think it should be. And this is just a clip from a study that was done and published this year, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well, that children in poverty are 70% more likely to develop asthma for life. And this is a big study that was done, a cohort study that was done, and it actually looked at the... Um, linkages between maternal education, many other factors, um, and also poverty. And it showed definitely that there was a very, very strong link between asthma and poverty. So you will be getting to see children with asthma, but you'll have to consider their poverty levels as well at the same time and what's going on at home. 
and again, I'm, a, I'm known for trying to make things complicated and other people try and make things simple. Um, and the reason I try and make things complicated because life is very complicated. And we sometimes, by trying to make it easier for ourselves, forget all the interactions and the linkages that happen between. So this is, picture is just one picture that I like to think of in my head. That if a child has asthma, what are all the different linkages that are happening that mean that their asthma is going to actually have developed because of these factors, or it's going to be worse than another child? So if you're in an inner city area, if you're in poverty, if you're in a, in a household where there's many, many people, your risks are going to be higher, either of getting asthma in the first place or actually the symptoms that developed, and also being able to manage that. So you'll see here, ethnicity is known to have a factor. And it may be that ethnicity actually does increase your risk of asthma, but actually from one of our studies, um, the MIA study, we actually showed as well there's higher attendance rates for people from different ethnicities. And that's not be necessary because their um, illness is worse. It's not necessary because they want to go to A&E over somebody else. But there's a long pathway to actually ending up in A&E, from diagnosis to understanding your disease to the education uh, to who influences you in the family, to actually getting treated in the end. And it's very co complicated just in that pathway, and that we can talk about in another time. Malnutrition, we'll talk about that. So the more we go into poverty, the more we're going to see malnourished children, the more asthma, um, severe asthma we're going to see. Overcrowdedness, you're all in a room together, you're breathing all over each other. Also pollution. If you're in poverty, you're more likely to live in a polluted area than somebody else. And then you're more likely to live in a home which has fungus on the walls, homelessness, moving from place to place where you can't keep the home clean, and then that risks infection. So a whole pot, really, of negative factors there. And what we must remember is this all starts very early on. So it starts from preconception, then it goes on through when the mother's pregnant, and then obviously from really up to the first five years of life, and then it continues. And that's quite important because when we think again of asthma management, we have to think of the life course. We can't just think of, okay, when a child comes at five years old, we're going to start treating them because actually a lot of the damage has already been done. So we have to think about looking after our mothers. I mean, we really do have to think. We have not only kids in poverty, but we have mothers in poverty. And those mothers who are going to give birth to babies who are small for dates, who are premature, the mothers who are unhealthy themselves in difficult environments, and those babies that are then developed and going to, and their lungs are going to develop from this. So you're giving these kids a really bad start to their lives, and trying to stop that, it's like a juggernaut coming our way. And you know, I, we, I don't think we've got any solutions, but it's we, we need to be aware of it. So for optimal lung development, so turning it a little bit round, is nutrition. So you've got to have good nutrition. You've got to have a balanced diet. You've got to have um, the vitamins that you need to actually make yourself healthy you've got to be able to exercise. And again, these are all the things that you all know about, but also are linked to um, poverty. You cannot exercise if you're in a tiny 30 meter squared room where there's lots and lots of kids running around and you've got no outdoor space to be able to run around in. Where do you exercise? You have to have clean air. And we're talking about two types of clean air. We're talking about internal clean air within the environment you're living in, and we're talking about external clean air. So you saw the picture before with pollution. You are in an urban area with cars going past you, your lungs are already messed up. On top of that, you go into, into some of the homes the families are living in, especially when it's shared or bed and breakfast and places like that. The smoke is coming through your doorway. You're breathing in other types of fumes, which you shouldn't. The ventilation is probably pretty poor. So you're double whammying yourself, really, and getting, getting into your lungs. So switching that round, I, I tend to talk, I do say the same thing a few times in, one, in different ways just to get the message through. But the risk factors then for respiratory illness are poverty, which, we, which we've been talking about all today. Lifestyle, what is your lifestyle? Do you exercise? Do you go out? Can you exercise your lungs? I mean, most of the kids we see will not be able to swim. They will not be doing sports. The environment that you're in, um, and then ethnicity, but we mustn't forget disability as well. Um, and as I've said, we've really seen this through the pandemic. It's got worse through the pandemic. And why we talk about families of different ethnicities and the minority groups is because we know from the data that those are the families who are living in more crowded conditions, who are high risk of poverty, and through COVID have actually lost a lot of carers as well.
So this um, table you can see is trying to show you the um, multiple deprivation score and asthma. So basically what it shows is the more deprived you are, the more asthma admissions you, you get. And this is what we've just been talking about. Many, many reasons for that, multiple reasons for that. Um, but you can see the graph there that clearly shows that there's a clear link with that. And another problem that's happened during COVID was, yes, we know that people have gone into even more overcrowded conditions. So they were locked down, they were not able to get out, they were not able to get fresh air, they were not able to get vitamin D. So the crowded conditions increased. So that asthma, asthma is a chronic condition, it doesn't just come and go, it's there all the time. So the more you're exposed to these conditions, it's there in your lungs and it's, you don't just get rid of it suddenly. We had a lot of reduced access to healthcare and, and many of you will have experienced that yourself. It was difficult for us to provide care to people. That means that children either didn't get their asthma assessed, they didn't get optimal treatment, but even more so, many of them were not diagnosed. So we have a whole host of children out there who were not being picked up at school, who were not being picked up by their healthcare systems or um, other school nurses where they might normally be picked up. So we do not know now how many kids are running around there where the damage has happened and have never been seen at all. And there was less health education. So we talk about asthma reviews, doing them regularly, but you can't do them regularly. We're really, where are we starting from? We're trying to educate these children and these families. So another problem, sorry about the pink that you can't see there, but um, another problem is that we now have long COVID. So on top of it, we're just starting to see the effects of um, COVID on children as well. And we know that there's an effect of COVID on children. It's not just on the adults, but the children tend to get a little bit forgotten. And we are seeing children who are tired, they've got heart problems, they've got lung problems, they've got respiratory disorders, and they have asthma as well. And we know that those cases are going up. And again, those are the kids who will be left within school to carry on, hope for the best, and will not then be able to enter, they'll be having days off school, and they'll go back into that poverty cycle again. So I like to show people this diagram, really because it is, again, meant to be complex. It's trying to show you, the, again, all the linkages between difficult breathing, respiratory illness, with all of these other lifestyle factors that we, we've been talking about. So lifestyle, poverty, environment, resources. Think of all of those four things together. You, you, you're less active because you're poor. You put on weight, you get a respiratory illness. You're poor, you have a worse diet, you get vitamin D deficiency and other vitamin deficiencies, so you get a, a respiratory illness. Your environment means you less, spend less time outside because it's polluted, you have nowhere to run around. You get poor mental stress, uh, mental health, and you get stressed. And we mustn't forget stress is a real exacerbator of asthma, and we forget that a lot. Children get anxious, children get scared, and it exacerbates their asthma. So mental health goes hand in hand with asthma. You cannot take the two away, which is why you'll see a lot of programs now talk about yoga, meditation, and deep breathing, and mindfulness. And of course, the environment of smoke, mold, and vermin, and, and we'll come on to vermin in a minute, um, and restricted access to healthcare. And the problem is, again, families who are in poverty or where there are inequalities often pull back from health services because they're fearful. They're fearful if they've missed one appointment, they're seen as DNA'd, so they miss another appointment, then they think social services is going to come after them, so they pull back even further. So you get families really hiding from view because we've set up a system that blames families in a way. And until we stop blaming families and we can try and support families, we're really pushing them away from our health service. So this was the paper that I was talking about earlier, which really says risk factors, and it's, yeah, you, can, you can't see it there, <laughs> you can see it there, risk factors of socioeconomic inequalities in persistent asthma in children. So this was a study that was just done in 2022 or published this year. So it's very clear that low income is linked to asthma, no doubt about that, exacerbations, hospitalizations, intensive care and admissions. Poor housing conditions, um, we know, we've just talked about that, are a key factor. And long-term stress, as I've said as well, is a risk factor. So I was talking about what I know, and you probably know from experience, but this is the data that now backs it up. And this shows a, a, another picture that they put together as well about relationship of poverty and asthma risk. And again, nothing different than what we've said, but the fact is that they've created a model that clearly explains that. Um, and socioeconomic circumstances um, at birth are a key factor as well. So if you've got poor socioeconomic circumstances at birth, you then have started life 
off in a, in a, in a sort of negative way already. So uh, it goes back to this thing about looking after our mothers, looking after pregnancy, post-pregnancy, the first two years of life being critical periods. So this is just to say, well, okay, you've got, you've got, a, you've got a home that looks like this. Um, what, what do we do about it? You know, you can't move around. You're living in cramped condition. You try running around with three kids like that. It's absolutely impossible to do. And then you have a home like this. Where do you store your things? Where do you store your medication? How do you access it? What do you do about it? You know, this is the real lives of what people are living in. Um, and then we see them in a surgery, and we just go, here, here's your head inhaler, go home, make sure you take it. And we forget about everything else that's happening. So just some, a few um, snippets from some of our work about what, what people have said to us. And these are just a few. I mean, we've got hundreds and hundreds of quotes. Um, this is just one slide to really um, bring it to life a little bit. So my daughter kept being sick because of stress and lack of sleep. And that, that's key. We talked about, I, I try and talk about the three S's, stigma, uh, sleep, um, and stress, really. And those three things go together. If you have asthma, many kids are stigmatized at school. They don't show children that they've, other children that they've got asthma. They are stressed, they ha are anxious, they can't breathe properly, and then they can't sleep at night either. They wake up all night and then they can't go to school. Poor education back into the poverty cycle. Access to food drastically dropped. You don't have food, you can't have your vitamins. My daughter's slightly asthmatic, so we had to increase her inhaler. But the parents didn't really know what to do. They couldn't engage with anybody, too scared to access healthcare. And we had loads of insects, and there were mice outside. We forget that even in the UK, a lot of these homes have lots of vermin, and those vermin carry infections, and those infections trigger off your asthma. So malnutrition, why is malnutrition important? Well, it impairs lung development. We know that, that if you're malnourished, you don't have enough vitamins, you don't have enough nutrition, you, your lungs do not develop properly. You then have a decreased immune response, so you can't fight infection. So if you can't fight infection, your asthma gets worse. And then you can't recover either from the illness. So it just goes on and on and on. So unless we actually feed our children in this country better, and that's a big problem we're going to now have, we're going to have increasing chronic illness, increased malnutrition, both hand in hand. And then vitamin D, we know that you're locked down in COVID, you're locked down even now. Um, and if you don't spend time outdoors, you're going to have a lack of vitamin D. Very, very clear evidence that vitamin D actually regulates um, immune, immune function. And if you're deficient in pregnancy, you can get child lung problems as well. So again, think of the mother, think of the child, think of nutrition. If you have reduced immunity, which happened a lot during the lockdown, you're exposing yourself to a lot of different pathogens as well. That then affects your immune system and your illness severity. Again, what I'm trying to show you is this, you, it's constant. If you're, if you're looking at these families, unless you tackle the food problem, you're not going to tackle their asthma problem. And we have another problem on top of it, is respiratory syncytial virus. Many of you will have heard of RSV, and RSV was pretty prevalent um, and it's always prevalent in the winter. So in winter 2021, and weirdly, it went down a little bit, and then it went up in the summer, and we think this is because of the interaction with COVID, children not going out as much. But it's, it was predicted it would go up last winter, and we think it's probably going to go up this winter. Kids are back at school now. They're all mixing again. The infections are going, and we're going to have another. So be ready for the, the winter. RSV, asthma triggers all coming together. It's coming our way. So... I won't stop, stop uh, talk about this too much because we've already talked about this, about pollution and passive smoking. I mean, we haven't really talked about smoking, but again, a lot of individuals in poverty are exposed to other types of fumes. So there'll be the car fumes, there'll be all of the fumes due to different drugs and things like that that they come across, and there'll be passive smoking as well. And how do you actually protect children fr from that? Vermin, like I said, I'd love to have a whole thing on vermin because actually we don't talk about vermin. And it's a real risk factor for families. We have heard stories of, and, and you will have heard it, I'm sure Sam's heard it, of kids with you know, rats in their cots or cockroaches running around, them sleeping on the floor, carrying infection, and we don't really tackle that at all. Damp mould uh, is there. But one thing that's going to also hit as hard is no heating. So we talk about no ventilation. You can't open your windows. You've got damp in the room because you're hanging your clothes up because you wash your clothes. Where do you put the clothes to dry? and then you put them on a line, you can't open the window, it gets moist and the mould starts growing and growing and growing. How do you clean that environment out for these children? 
And to just demonstrate that, there's this slide showing the environmental and illness cycle um, which I put together, which is about if you have poor housing, you're going to have increased respiratory infection. And the problem with increased respiratory infection is your metabolic rate goes up. So you're breathing harder, you, need, you work harder, you then need more food. We've talked about food. I keep talking about food more than asthma. But you need more food to actually feed this metabolic rate. You have insufficient nutrition, which we know. Um, and it was only on the news yesterday, somebody saying, which was really quite shocking, well, people will adapt their eating habits because of the current situation we're in. OK, that's great. Thanks very much. These kids are not going to get any food because you want us to adapt our eating habits. Um, and then you get poor immunity, illness, infection again, and you go round and round and round, and you never break that cycle. So this is just really bringing us back to some of the work that we've been doing on um, incident rate of child illness with, um, in hom homeless families. So if you're homeless, you are going to more likely to have respiratory infections, skin ailments, gastrointestinal problems and chronic physical disorders as well. I mean, here we're talking about the respiratory disorders, but everything is going to be higher. So if you've got one, you're going to have all of the other things going on, and you'll probably have eczema, as we've talked about, skin ailments, and those often go hand in hand anyway. Just looking at that. So we have another problem that happened during lockdown, which was no school meals. And I know that there's constantly a fight to get rid of school meals. Um, so one plea is we really need to make sure that doesn't happen because if we get rid of school meals and we get rid of all the breakfast clubs or anything else, um, it, it's going to trigger all these other problems that I've been talk to, talking about. Um, we didn't have structured exercise. We didn't have play. P children don't know how to use their lungs anymore. They don't know how to swim. They don't know how to breathe. They don't do music if you're in poverty. So you'll talk about other children who can play the saxophone or play this instrument or do whatever, uh, the children actually have not used their lungs. So how do we get our children to exercise their lungs? Um, you know, if you've had an accident, you're often given a balloon and you're often given that balloon to blow up. Simple exercises that we do, but these kids are not using their lungs in any capacity at all because they're not doing all the things that I've talked about. And they spend a lot more time often at home um, in, in the household. And just to uh, hit hard again on the final slide of this bit, which is about pregnancy, um, for all the people who are, involved, who are midwives or look after mothers as well, um, that time inside utero is key. And so whenever you see a mother in your clinic or, or who's pregnant, um, please just think, you know, what is her mental health? What's happening with her diet? What's happening with her exercise? And what are her environmental triggers? Because that will um, protect the baby that she's going to give birth to later on. So we talk about a bit of access to diagnosis and healthcare. Well, from our data in our MIA study, what families were basically saying, it was an interesting study, it was asking families really what they felt and why they, weren't, why they felt that asthma wasn't being recognised, why they felt they couldn't improve the health of their children with asthma. And we also asked professionals. And when it came to professionals, they felt it was because uh, people weren't educated, people didn't have the knowledge, we had to do more education. Um, People didn't speak the language, so we can't speak with them. And actually what the families were saying, it was nothing to do with that. It was to do with the fact that first they didn't know, recognize, nobody recognized that their child had asthma because the symptoms are so vague. When they went to the doctors and said, I think there's something wrong with my child, if it wasn't severe enough, it was like, go home again, come back later. If they, went, if they left themselves sitting at home and ended up in A&E, then they were told off for going to A&E because they were not utilising the services properly. So then they were scared to go back again. So getting a diagnosis was a key part of actually starting that pathway of treatment. We know that families um, during COVID were not accessing care, as I've said, um, and they were not getting physical examinations done. And we have a whole list of children now who will not be have, have had that assessment done. The question for all of you is, what do you do about that? So again, I learn a lot from when I go to India. It's like, you know, they have big programs and they do invest in big programs and they realize that every child cannot see a doctor when they need to see a doctor. And it's tragic that they can't, but then what they have to do, and I don't know if this is right or wrong actually, and I go through this ethical dilemma myself, but they will hold what they call health camps where children who don't want to, who want to overcome that barrier of going to a doctor can just turn up, get assessed, talk about their symptoms with a no blame sort of situation and do their peak flow or do whatever assessment they're having. And then at least the families feel that they've shared their problems and they can see. 
I don't know, do we need to be doing something like that here? We have so many children who are not diagnosed with so many problems sitting out there. So for anybody who wants to read the report on the MIA project, this was called Management and Interventions for Asthma. It's got a big report and it has all recommendations and what we could do. Um, and one part of that was an integrated approach to, um, it's called Act on Asthma. How do we set up training programs across GPs, paediatricians, families, um, third sector organisations that actually say the same thing so we don't confuse parents. Parents are very, very confused at the moment, don't really know what to do. And, and so when you're in a situation with all of these environmental triggers I'm talking about, you're going to be really, really confused with how you should manage your child. The other thing I just wanted to take to remind people of is family bereavements. Um, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because during COVID, lots of children lost lots of people, whether it was families, whether it was friends, whether it was peers. And when, when you're homeless in poverty, you have bereavements because you keep moving. And people forget that actually bereavement in itself is linked to asthma as well. And, and you might think, well, how is that linked to asthma? But if you've lost your caregivers, you've lost the people who look after you, you actually don't have the main person who's going to give you your inhaler or going to know about your inhaler. So we have to think who actually in the current time are, is looking after these children and who do we influence and who do we educate. So again, this just call the mother in system that we have may not actually be a system that's going to be sustainable and we might have to think a little bit out of the box. So what next? What next for all of you? What next for us? Well, what we've been trying to think of is how do we develop systems that actually consider um, linking up all of these things that we say. This was a different project that we've been doing. Um, but we really talk about holding hands together across all of these different factors that I've talked about. We have to work across health, we have to work across education, we have to work across politics, um, and we have to work with engineers and people in environment if we're going to actually crack this problem at all. We have to understand the link between them all, but we also, we're sitting here mainly as health experts, but actually we have to also link with all the people in the environment who actually change what's going to happen to our children. So we need a One Health approach, which we're talking about. One Health is often considered when we talk about um, uh, vermin or we're talking about animals and transmission of infections. Um, but I try and think of One Health as it's, it's like the WHO talk about it. An approach to designing and implementing programs, policies, legislation and research in which multi-sectors communicate and work together to achieve better public health outcomes. So we won't achieve anything on our own in a room. We have to really work together with all our partners in the different sectors. It's not easy, and I know that, because we bang our head against a brick wall many, many times trying to do it, and we only have so many hours in a day. So just to think some take-home messages are the health, education, environment sort of approach, that how do we put the child at the center? How do we holistically think of the future of our children? We need the government to really address social issues, such as poverty, such as nutrition, when it comes to health. At the moment, the two are divided. This is about food, that is about asthma. Even in our own integrated systems that we're now going to have, we have children's health separate, mental health separate, homelessness separate, poverty and other causes separate. The child doesn't look at it in that way. So we need public health approaches that address environmental factors with us in, in health and education as well. And education is very key, because if you're not healthy, you can't be educated. Researchers and funders need to consider those linkages. At the moment, it's very hard to get funding for these messy research projects. People want randomized controlled trials. They want very clean research studies that can show you an outcome in two years, which is nearly impossible to do. So we have to think in other ways, advocacy, campaigning, whatever we can do. And healthcare providers, we need to treat the person, the child, not the symptoms. We often think about the symptoms. Oh, their asthma's going up, their wheeze is doing this and we forget the child at the centre and what's, what they're going through. And we have to consider the barriers um, that prevent families coming to us and prevent them getting access to what we have to say. So integrating respiratory health into the overall health and wellbeing agenda is probably what we need. So I'll just leave you with this last slide. Our children are the rock on which our future will be built, our greatest asset as a nation. They will be the leaders of our country, the creators of our national wealth, those who care for and protect our people. So thank you all for coming today and um, lovely to speak to you all.